apart. You could see that, isn't it? One man crazy, three very sane spectators. When building your own Frankenstein monster, it's important to consider its organs. Its monster brains are little computers and electronics, its frame is its monstery bones, and the motors are its monstery muscles. Today, we're going to talk about the tendons. I don't know what the spindle is. Metaphors can get uh, unintentionally inappropriate quickly. Our monster's tendons are for attaching our motor muscles to our cast iron skeleton to make each arm, leg, and tail strong enough to overpower any innocent villager that gets in its way, but also precise enough to do surgery on them just in case we decide to use our monster for good instead of The problem with most machine monsters is that the muscles are very spinny. They spin around in circles instead of pushing and pulling the axes in the direction you want to go. This is the long way around of saying, we want to convert rotary motion into linear motion. Asterix. There are non-spinny ways to make a monster trash a village, like hydraulics, linear motors, or maybe even thermal expansion. And maybe we'll make some of those monster parts in a future episode. But for this, we've chosen the spinny things. Janet, make me a chart. Man, Janet's good at charts. Here's what I think about whenever buying tendons. First is the amount of backlash, or play in the system. Some things don't really matter for this, like our micro photography rig from a while back, since it only moves in one direction. Our monster needs to move in at least six degrees of freedom. Second is the drive resistance. If the tendons themselves use up all the motor power, then there's no power left for thrashing and smashing. Third is the accuracy over a distance, which means if you tell the machine to move 12 inches, does it move 12 inches or 12.1 inches? That would be a deviation of 0.1 inches per foot, or in scientific terms, miserable. And of course, these things cost money. And that money also has to feed the cats. Here are four basic options. Threaded rod, which is basically a very long screw. Does make turny turns into slidey slides, but that's about all it has going for it. They aren't made very precise, so they have high friction, lots of deviation, and their tiny threads are prone to nicks and burrs, which bind up easily and create a lot of resistance. Sure, it's cheap though. Might come in handy for something. Acme screws are much, much better about these things. They tend to be made more precisely, have nice square threads that don't get dinged up too easily, and are generally a good choice for lots of things. They do tend to have a lot more play in their nuts though. Which leads to lots of backlash about nut jokes. Even high quality ground ones are pretty affordable. One other thing not on this fancy chart, they can have low pitch angles, which means it takes a lot more motor turns to move a certain distance. That's a good reason to have manual machines use Acme screws. Ball screws recirculate a bunch of ball bearings inside, so the pitches have to be large enough to fit them. Less turny turns per slidey slides. They come in two categories. Rolled ones have these little lines between the threads that happen as part of the rolling process. They're pretty great about turning resistance, can have very little backlash, and are usually pretty good about their deviation. Though not perfect. They aren't cheap, but the cats will still get fed. Ground ball screws are the best of everything. More precise in every way, which also means tighter tolerances on the ball bearings, so they can be tuned to even less backlash. And of course, their distance per foot thing is downright spot on. One problem though, can't say no to that face. So rolled ball screws it is. Dave of Arizona CNC hooked us up with this excellent ball screw kit that also saves us the trouble of motor mounts and thrust bearings. By the way, invest in good thrust bearings when doing a thing like this. No amount of precision in your ball screws will count if the entire assembly can wiggle back and forth in cheap bearings, or even good ones that aren't meant to take axial load. Dave's uses angular contact bearings along with good couplers that look a heck of a lot like the ones we just used to upgrade the grinder. All right, let's get this kit installed. About the only modification you're likely going to have to do is enlarging the hole in the front of the Y-axis motor mount. And Dave is kind enough to supply a nice template to do so. The one supplied in our kit was made of wood. We decided to go ahead and make our own out of aluminum. This may look like a pain in the butt, but it's not too bad. If you get a good hole saw, drilling into cast iron isn't too difficult.
As you can probably tell, a lot of this install is just test fitting, making a few adjustments, and putting it back in. It's not too difficult, but you do have to take your time. Our foreman decided to come and check on our work. Turns out we were doing it wrong. The only other modification we had to make was on the motor mount on the Z-axis. For some reason, our casting was pretty wonky. I don't know if this is normal for Precision Matthews, but ours was definitely drilled, uh, let's say, not in the center. No big deal, we'll drill our own holes. We'll probably get more into the details once this thing is up and running, and I'll do a full review on the CNC kit. But so far it seems pretty awesome. Next week we'll see about making the monster move under its own power. Spoiler, it's fast enough to scare me, never mind the villagers. I was hoping maybe we could have a little dialogue about that. All right, Sharky4 says, I mean, be realistic. You made the thing out of tubing, Chinese linear rails, Chinese everything. It was never supposed to be perfect or anything even close to that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Dracula once said that you learn from failures and not success. We certainly had a lot of failures with this, and uh, I don't think we would have learned very much from just buying a perfectly good machine. Did Dracula really say that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Look it up. Okay. Uh, Solid Rock Machine Shop said, uh, oh, hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Uh, hi guys, thanks for the shout out. I've been following your build from the beginning and I'm quite impressed with what you've achieved. Uh, I never expected that kind of tolerance or finish. Well, neither did we, but we're happy with it. Um, the finish is due most likely to spindle noise. Also, dressing the wheel properly will make a huge difference. You need a faster traverse, no stopping or hesitation. Keep the traverse speed as constant as possible. A single point diamond should be mounted at 10 to 15 degree angle, pointed away from center of the wheel instead of straight up. Um, yeah, I recently watched your video and that was pretty much my first grinding project was to make the little diamond dresser tool that you did, so thank you. 
Um, I don't know if you guys watch Steve's channel. If you don't, he's been doing this for years and years compared to our minutes and minutes. <laughs> so you can learn a lot more from him about surface grinding. All right, uh, Rob R3 says, maybe have handles on each axis that have switches on them that when you start pulling, it turns off the motors to allow you to move the axes manually. That's, oh. That's a really good idea. Yeah, I like that. I, let's do that. Okay. All right, uh, everyone says, balance the wheel. I guess we forgot to show that on camera, um, but we do in fact balance the wheel and this goes for the dressing of the wheel too. We do that. We'll put a link in the description about how to do that. So I do have a question for everyone, which is do you dress the wheel, then balance it, then dress it again, or just balance it and dress it? Or is there some kind of like a rinse and repeat thing that helps if you have a particularly wonky wheel? All right, uh, Barry says, obviously big iron castings are unrealistic for a home built machine like this. Uh, but have you considered achieving the same thing with concrete? Yes, we have. In fact, we get a lot of suggestions about that and epoxy granite, and we want to do a video about that stuff specifically. That's a, that's a whole rabbit hole in itself. So. Yes, it is. Um, and we'll inevitably get a whole bunch more, you know, regarding the CNC to do this sort of stuff. Uh, just for reference, I do have a machine in the backyard that reuses about 850 pounds of concrete to uh, achieve sub arc second accuracy. Yeah, if you want to know more about that mystery project, comment below. Uh, Chris says, I stopped watching when I saw two grown men working in the shop, lifting and suspending heavy objects, wearing flip-flops. Wow. Oh, how did you make it past season one? We're terrible about this, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm literally wearing sandals right now. Andrew says, didn't this all start to rebuild a lathe? What's happening with that? Uh, Jimmy says, I love the show. You guys do amazing things with gut and gumption and ignorance, which is how we learn to do new things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thanks for the other comments too. Yeah, it's mostly ignorance, like 90% ignorance, 5% gut and gumption. All right, Tucker says, great video. The old guy who taught me basic machine skills claimed that if you had two pieces of tool steel perfectly parallel and flat, they would cold fuse if you put them together. Is this true? Is this something you guys are capable of now that you have your own surface grinder dialed in? Thanks again for the videos, really enjoyed it. Yeah. So it is totally a thing, although this is not cold welding, that's a slightly different deal. Um, it is possible. Uh, there's some great NASA articles about doing that in space. Um, our surface grinder is not even capable of this, which is ringing. All right, uh, Arthur says, stop with the audio tone and color bar every time you make a mistake. It's very distracting and 